Today, we are going to be talking about dorms. So when you think of a university, often dorm living or residence goes hand in hand. First year students are typically living alone for the first time ever, and dorm seems kind of like a weird pseudo in-between step because you're not quite living on your own, but you're also away from your parents. So for a lot of people, it seems like the perfect transition. Like for me, especially in the midst of so much change and anxiety, dorms just seemed like the given option. However, at what cost? So there are three different kinds of dorms. There's just regular dorms that are owned by the university. There's semi-private dorms, which are partially owned by a corporation, but still affiliated with a given university. And then there are fully private dorms. And that's where things start to get a little bit sticky. Let's head downstairs. We're doing this right now. So how do we figure out how much normal dorms cost versus private dorms versus just paying for an apartment? And how can we compare these in a way that makes sense? First, I needed to narrow down which schools I was looking at. So I started with the five largest universities in Canada based on student population. That's University of Toronto, York University, University of Alberta, University of British Columbia, and University of Montreal. It's important to note that these are very high student population schools in very dense urban areas, likely where housing is most scarce. So perfect for this video. Here is your classic dorm room. I would call this a shared bedroom and calling this a paired room, a double room, a bachelor pad, studio apartment are just some of the titles I found referencing this shared bedroom style. The other option I looked at is a single room. Pretty much the same as the shared room, but there's only one bed and you're alone. It's hard to compare the two because the apartment equivalent for both would be a one bedroom or studio apartment. Paying rent in dorms is not the same as a regular apartment. For starters, rent is typically listed as the entire price for the eight or 12 month contract where you pay two to four installments, meaning what it ends up equaling monthly is not obvious or an afterthought. Secondly, the number listed is often before the cost of a meal plan, but at most of these residences, the meal plan is mandatory. Therefore, it should be listed with the rent. I've included meal plan costs in these calculations. Lastly, and probably most importantly, they list the dorm fees per person. For example, if it says you're paying $14,381 for a shared room, that is really $1,797.63 a month. But that's only your half of the rent because remember, you're sharing this unit with another person. So in actuality, you and your roommate are paying a combined $3,595.35 for one bedroom. Yikes. With the private dorms, usually the rent isn't even listed. You have to call to get the numbers and the phone calls I was making involved long spiels, requests for personal information, lots of tiptoeing around the actual numbers. Things like listing rent per week or per person or only a ballpark number are very unique to dorms. This would not fly on a regular apartment listing. So let's look at the data. What we have here is the average from each of our five universities of a single room in a private dorm, a single room in a university dorm, and then a two bedroom apartment divided by two plus $200 for groceries to compensate for the per person rent and cost of a meal plan. And then the same for the shared room, except the rent equivalent is a one bedroom apartment divided by two, again, plus $200 for groceries. Um, so obviously the first thing that jumps out is just this red bar just towering over all the other bars. Um, that's the private dorm rate. And so obviously it's just so much more expensive than the other options. And we have to remember that the university dorm is pretty much the same option. So the leap in price there, I'm gonna leave that for you to decide whether that makes sense. Um, the rent equivalent though, it is much lower, but we have to keep in mind that a typical apartment is not furnished and dorm rooms are. The dorm rooms come with a couch and a bed. So furnished, if you wanna call that furnished. Also, I think what stands out here is obviously University of Montreal's, the red is so much higher than both options. And that's because 
Montreal has a double rent control, like two different rent control laws, but dorms are exempt from that, meaning they can pretty much charge whatever they want. And the same applies to the other ones, but I think that it's most obvious in Montreal's graph. Also, it's important to note that the rate for the single private room is pretty close to the shared room, even though the shared room is shared. Like, it's literally one room that you share. So just something to keep in mind. As you can tell, it requires a lot of effort to draw a direct comparison between dorm costs and regular rent. Still, even I'd say it's almost impossible to draw a direct comparison because of the value of an apartment in terms of facilities and space. However, obviously dorm living still holds a value, but the biggest obstacle is understanding what you're being sold. And not only was this information difficult to compile, it was hard to understand, even after I'd already been through it. Universities and private companies recognize dorms have a value proposition, so it really becomes about what they decide to charge for that value, and whether you think it's worth it. Is it? So where do we go from here? While we wait for affordable and accessible student housing to become a reality, students can start by protecting themselves. I talked on the phone with a representative from Toronto Tenant Association and kind of was just like, how do students protect themselves? Please spare some knowledge. Knowing your rights as tenants. What he told me was that the main thing that people aren't aware of is that there are circumstances where you are not covered. For example, when you are living in A, accommodation provided by an educational institution. B, accommodation provided primarily to underage tenants. C, accommodation without its own bathroom or kitchen. But when you are covered, the main things he said people don't realize are their right as tenants is that one, rent increases are governed under the law. Two, a landlord cannot ask you to move without a specific reason. And three, lease renewals are not required. But bottom line, the biggest way students can protect themselves is just doing a little reading. I mean, you're already doing enough of it anyways. <laughs> little university joke there. And using resources like torontotenants.org, there's similar websites in any given province, looking at your city's website, like the city of Edmonton or the city of Vancouver. If you have a question, you can always just call and be like, is my landlord allowed to do this? And he said, always remember, just because a landlord says it doesn't mean it's true or legal. Tenants can very often say no when a landlord asks you to do various things. And I think as young people, we are especially vulnerable to being misled. And so reviewing your tenant rights should be your first step in your hunt for housing. I know just in my experience, I'm not saying that like landlords are monsters or something, but you don't have to just give them the benefit of the doubt. And I think I'm definitely guilty of that, like assuming they have my best interest in mind, assuming they wouldn't do something illegal, but you never know. And no one's protecting you except yourself. So these are the things we have to know.